A lot of you turned on your TVs or your streaming devices on third Wednesday nights, easy for me to say, and were witness to a train wreck, a dumpster fire, one that perfectly epitomizes and represents where we are right now. Now, of course, I'm referencing the vice presidential debate because AEW Dynamite was actually pretty good this week. And you know what? Maybe it holds to something as simple as the opening match put me in a really good mood for the rest of the night. And that certainly could be the case. Uh, probably that and the way that the show closed. Put me in a really good mood. Because seeing Brian Cage versus Will Hobbs was a welcome breath of fresh air for me. Seeing these two guys that I see have, uh, having upside, having potential that are so different to a lot of the people that you see featured on the roster, whereas you got so many smaller vanilla midget, no personality, having asses that are flipping and bumping and high spotting and no selling their ways and got to get all your shit in type of performers. You know, here are two guys that are working a more physical, you know, power based type of match. And it works for both of them helps their match really stand out, help them as a byproduct really stand out, and I think actually makes things better for others on the show because you have that contrast there. I guess it's the second week in a row that I thought they had a really good opener for Dynamite. Last week it was because of the story between Starks and Darby Allen. This week it's just more about the different style that's there. And I like the little bit of a tease there of Taz trying to offer Will Hobbs a spot on Team Taz. Uh, the whole thing about having Darby Allen run out, you know, you're setting up maybe do a tag match next week, whatever, cool. But, you know, I thought it was a really good showcase for Real, Will Hobbs and a good showcase for Brian Cage as well. And like I said, to me, got the show off to a really good start. And what's needed when you get to the next match, you talk about the featuring and presentation. Why is FTR working a 50-50 competitive, we got a struggle to overcome style of match against two jobbers like freaking TH2? What the hell is wrong with them? Like, you don't have 10 or 12 champions, so your champions actually have to mean something here. You got a men's singles world title, a men's singles kind of mid-card TV title in the TNT title. You've got your women's champion, who doesn't really mean crap to you, because you don't ever put her on TV. And then you've got your tag championship, your tag titles. So really, you have three belts that actually matter out of the four, three belts that you actually give a crap about out of the four. So I, I find it befuddling and stupendously stupid to put FTR in this type of spot. Now, I already think they're battling a bit of an uphill battle as a team because this is a type of team, a little more basic, a little more old school, that really feeds off of the more traditional tag match type of style and especially comes into play when you have a full audience and you could do those traditional heel tactics and you could get heat on somebody and you could do those things it works better for me in that dynamic for them. So already facing a little bit of an uphill battle as a team. Now you put them in a situation where you're making them look bad because everybody they're going up against, because you're persisting and insisting on having them wrestle it seems like every damn week. Everybody you put them up against just has to get all their shit in. You got to work for TVT. That's not making stars out of FTW or FTR, whatever. Because when I look at FTR and I see what they're doing with them right now, I'm saying WTF. Stop doing all the 50-50 matches. One of the most annoying things I see in professional wrestling. And especially stop doing that with teams that are clearly out of their league. You know, are not in their league whatsoever. TH2 is terrible. They're nobodies. They're just another set of guys. They're jobbers, jabronis. You should not have be having your tag champions working this type of match against them. And that's just my opinion. Uh, the one-hour main event, it did surprise me a little bit that it came at this point in time in the show until people started pointing out, you know, it makes sense to probably run it early because of the VP debate. And then I started thinking about, it, you know, like, you're worried about a lot of people jumping off. You know, Cody ain't about to sit there and wrestle his match in front of nobody, so he's got to get his stuff in, that's for sure. That egomaniac. So it, it made logical sense here to do the dog collar match kind of in the middle of the show, pop that quarter-hour rating before everybody flipped over to see what was going on with Pence and Harris. It made sense. Oh, the match I thought was perfectly fine. It was a dog collar match. It was brutal. It was bloody. That's exactly what it should be. I love the nod to the past by having the maskless Greg the Hammer Valentine in attendance sitting front row like harkens back to him and Roddy Roddy Piper in their dog collar match at Starcade 83. Like, love it. 
Like, love how you tie into the history and you're featuring the now. Um, and the match worked really well. Like, I won't even necessarily gripe or complain about having Cody win and, you know, having him beat Brody Lee like this. I won't gripe about it. Just because he's the EVP? Like, that, to me, in and of itself, doesn't really bother me. It, it really doesn't. You would think it should. You would think because I can't stand the piece of crap as a person that, you know, I would have a problem with it, but I really don't. And ultimately, it's the mid-card title anyway, so what the hell difference does it make? Uh, so the match, I thought, was perfectly fine. I have no problem with him winning. Uh, the post-match stuff, though, like, if you're going to kiss your wife, can you at least wipe the blood off of your lips? That's all I'm saying. Um, you know, even that, having him come out, like, yeah, that starts to harken a little bit back to his daddy and, you know, just another thing he likes to rip off because he likes to rip off a bunch of things. Um, but just felt a little bit over the top there. Like, it wasn't necessarily needed or required. Uh, but actually, the only thing that really bothered me was the post-match promo, which I thought was only saved by Orange Cassidy answering the challenge to face Cody for the TNT title next week on the one-year anniversary show. Uh, the promo, it felt too much like he's ripping off his daddy. I'm just calling it as it is. Like, too over the top, too sappy. Lacking in the charisma that his dad had to be able to pull off that stuff just didn't work for me. Sorry, it just doesn't. Call me a Cody hater all you want, but I just talked about the match was good, and I had no problem with him winning the title, but I thought the promo after the match sucked. Just my opinion. Um, what else we got? Speaking of things that were odd or just kind of sucked, the Kenny Omega promo, like... Is it just me, or has he been a raging disappointment? Like, so many people have been pumping him up for years. So, when it came to Dynamite starting last year and AEW really becoming a thing as a company, like, I was kind of a little bit curious, admittedly, even if morbidly, to see what's the big deal about the cleaner, Kenny Omega. And so many people have been bronzing this guy's balls and kissing and licking his sphincter hole like he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And maybe this is just a, a sign of not everybody's for everybody, but I don't get it. I think he's been a waste a lot of ways in AEW. I think he's been a raging disappointment. And now that he's kind of off on the singles thing, like the way, you know, you had him kept talking about mentioning Hangman Page. Yes, that makes sense. But the whole promo and cadence and execution of his promo, his interview, was just bad. Like, I just don't think it worked. Like if he's trying to present him as some type of villain, some type of heel... Like, it felt like you could have went in a much different direction than this. It just, it was really bad. Again, my opinion, but that's kind of what I thought about it. What I think also about really bad things, though, I think about the really bad things that I would let Big Swole do to me. Yes, yes. You will rock your armbands in my house, I promise you, and then fuck me up. Take my white ass to the cleaners. That's what you do. Throw me around. And fucking just ravage me. That's what you do, Big Swole. You do whatever the hell you want. But see, Serena Deem wrestling again. Cool stuff. Yay. She's got a job again. Hooray. I find it interesting that while women are getting a match here, at least on the show, and getting a few minutes, that's certainly nice and refreshing for this company. Um, yet another week where the champion isn't featured. That's really weird. Yet another week where the champion's not featured. Why have a champion if you're never going to use them? Why have a champion if they're not going to make an impact? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. But reality is, is once you got past kind of the dog collar match, everything was just building up to what was the real main event of the night, celebrating Le Champion and 30 years of Jericho. And the video packages they did throughout the night were outstanding. They really mixed up the show well. And it was awesome to see all these people from sports and entertainment and music and movies and wrestling all sending their best regards to Jericho because 30 years in the business and not just 30 years in the business as a jobber, but 30 years in the business with over two decades of them of being a sizable, notable star in the business is no small accomplishment. Like that is a huge achievement. It really is. So I'm happy that they had this spot for Jericho, something to kill the time until you got to the one year anniversary show next week. Sure. Um, the only thing I didn't like about it was the fact that they had this guy that looks like he's in his mid-40s, late-40s, early-50s, kind of washed-up, 
backyard garbage wrestler Luther wrestling in the freaking main event on Dynamite. Like, he looks like an old backyard wrestler that just didn't realize he never connected. I know there's different history there. and Maybe Jericho wanted to work with him. He wanted to help out an old buddy from the past. I don't know. I don't really care. It's his moment. It's his body. Do whatever he wants. Doesn't mean that I have to like it. Nor does it matter if I necessarily like it. Uh, but the segment and the celebration after the match, him and MJF, like that was magnificent. Wherever they're going to go with this and wherever they land with this next it is captivating me right now. And I want more, 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 more. And I also appreciate the touch at the very end as they broke out a little bit of the rumbling. And they're all celebrating Le Champion. Having the heels and only the heels come out and celebrate. And they're already the graphics. And Jericho's the director, the producer. He's working all the cameras. Like, fantastic. I absolutely loved it. It was obnoxious. I only wish it was perhaps even more over the top, more self-aggrandizing and all of that. But... It just kind of makes me realize, like, how long Jericho's been around and how great of a talent he's been for so many years. And he's one of those guys that you could take for granted. And when I think about it strictly from a professional wrestling standpoint, like, there are certain guys that rank at the very top of the list for me when it comes to true respect. Like, true respect. Undertaker's one. Mick Foley's another. And certainly Chris Jericho is towards the top of that list from a pure respect standpoint. And maybe I throw an edge in there as well to a degree, but probably not as much. But guys that have done big things in the business over the years, guys that took advantage of opportunities when presented and made the most of them, guys that had the flexibility to work as baby faces or heels and do it effectively, guys that were characters, personalities, that could work in the ring, that could tell stories with their matches, you know, all of these things. But as much as anything else, guys who were unselfish sometimes do it a fault, to a fault of their own, where it could have potentially hurt them if they weren't such great legends. But looking to help out that next generation and realizing and understanding it's not just about them and that it's about others and that, you know, if you elevate more people and more people matter, then you have the potential for everybody to make more money. And Jericho is one of those guys to me that has always gotten it. Like, I know it's easy to say as somebody looking from the outside in when it comes to professional wrestling, well, who the hell are you to judge whether or not somebody gets it or not? You could tell sometimes based off of history, based off of stories, based off of what you see, what happens, whether people get it or not. Some people get it in terms of themselves and only themselves, like a John Cena type of individual. He only really truly got it when it was too late. Like, now you don't matter. Now it has no impact. Now you're doing movies, so you don't give a crap if you lose. It doesn't matter to you anymore. But when it did matter, when it did make a difference, using him as an example, time after time after time, he made selfish, wrong decisions. And you can't just blame Vince. You know damn good and well Cena was involved with that. Whereas you look at Jericho time after time after time, you could ultimately actually fault him for being too unselfish at times, too a fault. I mean, for God's sake, this guy's losing a Fandango at WrestleMania. But... You know, I think I think it's cool, you know, outside of the recent stuff, like with the COVID super spreader stuff or whether or not he's a Trump supporter, I, I, I'll, look, I'll look past that for the time being because who cares? Um, the reality is, though, when you look at Jericho, he's an absolute legend. You know, for me, my history watching him goes back to the days of the late 90s and WCW before he made the jump over and made it. Ah, is Jericho! Beating The Rock and Stone Cold at the same night to become undisputed champion. And all these things that he's done over the years, man. You know, we talk about Chris Jericho, maybe what he looks like now. And he's not in the best shape or he's not in the best condition. Uh, but damn, man. You know what? You've done all the stuff that he does over the years. And you've given all that you've given to wrestling and given back as much as you've given back to wrestling. Maybe it doesn't matter so much. And these are the types of guys sometimes that maybe we should do more to memorialize and tribute when they're still alive. To let them know like how much of an impact they've had, how many, how much good work they've done, and how much we've appreciated them for everything that they do. So I'm going to close out this week's Dynamite review by saying, hey, if you like what you heard here, smash that subscribe button, click the bell, what the hell, so that way you're notified of future videos when I upload them. Um, but more importantly, leave your comments. So let me know what you think of when you think of Chris Jericho. What are his greatest moments? What are his highlights? What are his favorite matches, promos, segments, like all of that? Like, let's make it a celebration of the champion in the comments section this week. Sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. 
I'll see you next week. Later.